This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, March the 12th, here at the Niles Public Library in the year 2008. Um, and um, Mr. Abramson and myself are sitting here in the auditorium of the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea, I'm a member of the reference staff here, and I'm speaking with Irving M. Abramson. Uh, Mr. Abramson was born on January the 10th, uh, 1926, and he now lives in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, Mr. Abramson has kindly consented to be interviewed um, for this project. Um, he also has uh, prepared for this interview um, by bringing some uh, typed out recollections of uh, some aspects of his time in the service in World War II in the U.S. Army in Europe. Um, so uh, here is his uh, memoir of service. Mr. Abramson, uh, when did you enter the service? Uh, in uh, August of uh, 1943, I enlisted uh, at the age of 17. Had you completed high school at that time? Or? I had completed high school and had started college. I was going to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology at that time. Were you on a science or a technical was, or an engineering? I sort was of an a... engineering student. Uh, mechanical engineering was my major. And you chose to enlist rather than wait to be drafted, is that? Well, what had happened was that uh, the Army came into many of the colleges and gave a aptitude test to the, uh, I think it was especially to the engineering students. And uh, if uh, you, if the student um, scored high enough in that test, uh, the Army offered to send that person to college at the government expense uh, until graduating. And uh, then that person would uh, be a, uh, come out of college as a second lieutenant in the Army, and the only uh, uh, thing that the Army wanted was a promise for the student uh, or soldier to stay in the service for three years. Uh, in that the uh, tuition was very high at that time, although probably negligible compared to today's. Uh, it sounded uh, very appealing. I spoke to my parents about it, and uh, they were, of course, dead set against their 17-year-old joining the Army, enlisting. And uh, But after three days of argument, uh, they finally consented, and I indeed uh, uh, enlisted in the uh, Army Reserve because I couldn't be in the Army until 18. And uh, they did, at that time, uh, uh, follow their promise and sent me uh, to the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, I, I continued my engineering education there for a short time. I uh, believe it was for two terms. Uh, at the end of that, I had become 18, and uh, unfortunately the Army had uh, decided to disband that program program was called Army Specialized Training Program. And uh, the war had become uh, hot and heavy, and they decided they needed soldiers more than uh, engineers. So uh, they disbanded the program. I got notice to uh, uh, discontinue my uh, student uh, time at UW and uh, report to Fort Sheridan in uh, Illinois for induction into the Army. And were you, um, you must have had probably mixed feelings at that time, did you? Or? Very disappointed in that uh, uh, the Army did not follow up with their promise. Uh, and uh, I think all of us, there were a large number of us that were in the same program, and we all felt very cheated at the time uh, because we very well might have continued uh, our college education where we were and possibly gotten a deferment uh, for uh, uh, being a, in an engineering school, which many 
of the engineering students got at that time uh, was questionable, and uh, I uh, I didn't worry about it too much. Uh, I wasn't really thrilled about being ushered no. into the in infantry. I'm sure your parents weren't either. I no, 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 a, no, no. They, of course, uh, hated to say, I told you so. Yeah, I bet. And at that time, your family lived in Chicago? They, at that time, were in Chicago. Uh, my father was in business on, uh, in Albany Park and uh, uh, at that moment. And uh, so that's where I went to the Army from. Yeah. And you had attended um, Lane Technical High School? Yeah, early. Uh, I had uh, uh, gone all four years of my high school uh, education at Lane Tech. Very wonderful school at that time. So you come down to Fort um, Sheridan then. Right. So then you had you had to have a basic training experience then? Right. And where yes. did that take place? Uh, I uh, was sent uh, at that time to... Um, uh, uh, that was uh, North Carolina. Uh, uh, for the moment, I've forgotten the camp, but uh, it was uh, a basic training camp in North Carolina, and I spent uh, my uh, my initial military training there. Uh, right after that, we were given a pass to go home and uh, wait for further assignment. I shortly thereafter received uh, an assignment to uh, uh, join the uh, 100th Infantry Division, uh, which uh, was also based uh, in uh, Georgia. And uh, I uh, trained with them for a short period. And uh, then uh, from there, we went to Europe. Was, um, was that your? The, the the training uh, training camp experience in um, in North Carolina was that the first time you'd been of course you'd been away at, at University of Wisconsin in Madison so that wasn't your first time away from home right um, uh, well the uh, the trip to Wisconsin was the first time really yeah. away from home and then was it uh, sometimes it's interesting interesting experiences being in a a camp away from home with people from all over the country and all different oh, yeah. backgrounds and it's uh, it oh, yeah. real, I imagine it was a real insight into what America was becoming. Or really, really. It was not only uh, a melting pot uh, of nations but a melting pot of different parts of the country and uh, meeting uh, people from uh, Appalachia and uh, all over the uh, United States was an interesting experience. The um, so then you were assigned to the, was it, did you mention the 100? Yeah, the 100th Infantry Division was uh, known uh, as the Century Division. And then you set sail for for Europe then from a particular? Uh, from uh, our camp in uh, Georgia, we uh, were sent to uh, New York uh, where um, uh, most of the uh, troops were being sent to Europe. and. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. That's where uh, we uh, debarked from. Uh, we uh, left from uh, the uh, ports in New York and zigzagged across the Atlantic to Europe. The um, so you were in this uh, this tech training path, as it were, and then the army discontinues this engineering preparation program or whatever. Yes. And then when they place you in the army. It, what your aptitudes were or your academic training were had no bearing on where they placed you in, in the Army. You were just a regular infantry, is that right? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, nothing in my past experience meant anything. I had been a, uh, an excellent photographer and it had been my hobby for uh, some years. And uh, I uh, tried to uh, tell them about that because they needed um, uh, photographers. And I uh, talked about my engineering training, but nothing mattered. They needed infantry, and uh, that was the bottom line. So when you zigzagged to avoid German submarines, I suppose. That was the story, And yes. you're in a convoy, I right. suppose. Do you land in Scotland? Or no, no. We, uh, we zigzagged across the Atlantic and landed finally in Marseille, France. Oh, yes. And uh, that was a big port. 
uh, we, uh, the Americans had already made their initial landing in France and uh, had already gotten a pretty good foothold by the time uh, we arrived. And uh, so we arrived in Marseille and uh, started our march through France and Germany from there. And was that difficult going? Uh, well, uh, by then uh, we had pr pretty well hardened by our military training and uh, uh, knew, what, uh, knew what to expect in terms of uh, effort uh, required. Uh, the uh, sound, the first sounds of exploding artillery and uh, gunfire when we got near the front were a bit uh, shocking and uh, very frankly scary. Uh, so uh, we were introduced to that within a short time after landing. And that was still, that was in, still in France. That was uh, uh, yes, we were in the uh, oh the eastern part of France. Uh, just before uh, going into Germany. Uh, and um, how was army food at that time? Were you, did you feel like the well looked after in the field or? Uh... No, uh, all during uh, uh, basic training <laughs> and uh, training with the Century Division, uh, we uh, were treated to army camp food and uh, that uh, well, it was uh, strictly institutional food preparation. But at that time, uh, we were working very hard and uh, training very hard. And uh, any uh, moment to relax and uh, uh, have a, a meal uh, was not a time to complain about anything that was served us. Once in Europe, uh, we were given uh, rations. And uh, each of us carried rations. There were a couple of different kinds. There were C rations and K rations. The uh, C rations were uh, prepared canned foods, which uh, could be heated over a Bunsen burner or uh, 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 any kind of heat that you could uh, uh, get uh, get going. And the C rations were dried uh, food that came in a box similar to a Cracker Jack box. And it uh, contained uh, crackers, cheese, uh, a chocolate bar, uh, stuff of that nature. The uh, canned stuff uh, was corned beef hash and uh, stew and uh, that type of food. Was it either one or the other? or? No, we were equipped with both. So you need to put them both uh, together, you had a pretty good yeah, idea? Yeah, you or? could do that, but we uh, usually didn't do that. We didn't eat uh, too much at any one time and we would either choose one or the other at any one moment uh, when we decided to stop and uh, partake of some food. And were you, were you able to um, write home to your parents and during, family and yes, during this time? During the uh, period of training, especially back in the U.S., uh, much uh, contact was had via mails with um, the family and friends. Uh, once in Europe, it became a little more difficult for the mail to get to us, especially once we had gone into uh, the battlefield and up at the front lines. Uh, every once in a while, I would say possibly uh, every few weeks, uh, we would stop at a rest area and the uh, mail would catch up to us. But it, well, it was not too often. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that as you work your way north, the 100th Division from Marseille up to East Central France and closer to Germany. I'm imagining that it's getting hotter uh, and, and... Uh, hotter by virtue of the action? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Much, very much so. Uh, Temperature-wise, it was quite cold. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we were there during the winter. And uh, it was, quote, cold and... Uh, uh, many a night was spent in a uh, foxhole uh, with uh, rain uh, coming down, and uh, I at one point uh, uh, was in a foxhole for about uh, eight or ten hours with uh, freezing water up to my ankles. And uh, uh, in the morning, when we decided, to, when the uh, our commanders decided to move out, I couldn't move. I couldn't uh, walk. And uh, they took me back to a rest 
and uh, recuperation area where I stayed for about uh, uh, 48 hours. And uh, fortunately, I uh, did not have frostbite, but uh, close to it. And uh, so the weather was very cold, and uh, it snowed. And uh, so we were subject to that kind of thing. This is November, December 1944? Right. Correct. Correct. And then all the time you're getting closer to the, I'm imagining, to the Battle of the Bulge that area right. that you mentioned, you mentioned that is, here on your form. That is yeah. correct. Uh, as we approached uh, Germany, uh, uh, we were pushing the Germans back, of course, to into their own land. And uh, uh, they became, uh, uh, our, the action became quite heavy. And uh, we had, uh, we were subject to a tremendous amount of artillery attacks, more than uh, anything. We did have a number of uh, uh, frontline uh, rifle skirmishes with uh, German troops, and uh, uh, that was always uh, uh, scary and, uh, and dangerous. But uh, the big danger was from the artillery. The Germans were very adept at their artillery attacks. They had uh, artillery equipment that uh, they could zoom in and uh, uh, the soldiers would say they could put uh, a shell in your hip pocket if they wanted to. And uh, of course, as I say, the artillery attacks became uh, more numerous as uh, we approached Germany. Uh, in the finally in uh, uh, in the end, that's what where I uh, was uh, wounded uh, in uh, de on December uh, 11th, 1944. Uh, we were uh, in the Black Forest, and uh, uh, we had dug in uh, into foxholes, and uh, the shells began to fly. Uh, the bombardment uh, lasted, uh, it seemed like for hours, but I'm sure it probably wasn't more than 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, but during that time, shells uh, came, it were exploding all around us. Uh, I was in a foxhole. We had just begun to dig in. The foxhole that I was in with uh, two of my buddies was only about a foot deep when the shells began flying and uh, we could no longer uh, stand up or kneel down and dig. We just lied down flat in this one foot deep foxhole. Uh, there was a soldier on either side of me. I was in the middle and uh, uh, we just lied there while the shells exploded all around us. Uh, of course, uh, the rest of my outfit was uh, spread around the area as well. Uh, in, uh, at dusk, uh, the, uh, the, shells, uh, the, the shells started about dusk. And in the morning, uh, all I remember is waking up to daylight. And uh, the, uh, there were aid men, first aid men, standing above me and uh, helping me up. Uh, and uh, I found out later that the two other soldiers, one on each side of me, were killed. Mm. Uh, it was uh, quite shocking. Uh, the, um, so did you, did you recall when exactly you were hit? No, I do not. I do not uh, recall it. You were lying on when, the ground with... Right. And then... Through uh, the night, and then through through the night, and then right. morning came, and uh, as a matter of fact, during I, I had already been wounded, unbeknownst to myself, and I could not understand later on why I did not feel pain, and the doctors uh, explained that uh, uh, your your body is traumatized, and uh, uh, I guess that going into shock, uh, you just don't feel the pain. There's other things involved. It's a physiological thing that I, I I will not ever understand, but at any rate, so I you were hit do in the not, back in, 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 in the back of uh, no my the shell that got me had uh, uh, I think I was lying on my right side with my left side exposed, and uh, 
somebody said uh, later on that the shell might have hit a tree and the shrapnel bounced off the tree and hit my left side. My entire left side uh, had uh, been torn up uh, by uh, fragments, artillery fragments. My left leg was broken. Um, uh, both bones of my lower left leg, the tibia fibula, were broken in half. Uh, my chest was uh, punctured. I uh, have a, uh, today I have a six inch scar in my chest where shells, where, they, where a part of a shell entered, punctured my chest and punctured uh, my lung. Uh, how I ever survived all of this, I don't know. It was a miracle. Do you think it was the, I don't know if this is an appropriate question. Do you think it was the same shell that so injured you also was responsible for, for, for taking Very away likely. the lives of your two Very uh, likely. soldiers? Yeah. Very likely. Um, it was hard to tell because there were so many shells landing at that time. But uh, certainly... Uh, so you're taken back to a, a, a hospital or a medical area? In, yes. In uh, if uh, many people are familiar with the uh, uh, program MASH, uh, and this was a... Uh, right uh, a has first aid hospital right behind the lines of any uh, battlefield and uh, uh, the, the program well described what these hospitals were like and uh, they were uh, the purpose was to uh, immediately save the soldier's life rather than uh, uh, try to heal up uh, the wounds necessarily and I was taken back to a MASH hospital I was unconscious for three days, uh, whether it was uh, the drugs or the shock or, or what it was, I don't know. But I woke up three days later and uh, uh, there were uh, nurses around and I was still in a haze. Uh, they had given me a considerable amount of morphine to uh, counteract the pain, so I wasn't entirely uh, with it. but. Um, uh, slow but sure, my head began to clear, and I was aware that uh, the Army, uh, uh, and, uh, with all injured uh, soldiers, immediately sent notification to the family by way of a Western Union telegram. Uh, the first thing that hit me was uh, if my parents saw that telegram, uh, they would be frightened to death, and I had to try to contact them prior to that telegram. I didn't know how fast the telegram went out. Uh, I was encased in a cast uh, from uh, my toes up to my waist. My chest was uh, bandaged uh, with pressure bandages and I couldn't really move. I was flat on, <coughs> excuse me, I was flat on my back. So I couldn't, of course, write. My first uh, thought was to uh, write my parents a letter saying that uh, I was okay. Uh, one of the nurses came by and I asked her if she would be kind enough to uh, write this short letter that I dictated and send it back to my parents. She said she would uh, be happy to. So I dictated a letter and uh, uh, the letter went out. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it went out after the, they got the telegram. When they got the telegram, they were quite shocked and uh, uh, because of all of the soldiers that were wounded and killed at the time, we lost uh, 10,000 men in the Battle of the Bulge. So uh, there was quite a few of those telegrams that went out. Yeah, the, you're kind enough to um, submit a copy here of that Western Union telegram, which we'll include in your uh, memoir, and it, it, it informs your parents that you've been seriously wounded. Right. So they must have been... Right, they were quite shocked, yeah. and uh, and uh, uh, more so because they could not get additional information. Uh, the uh, the, the um, pardon me, the was that where, where you were wounded? Was that near a particular town, or or when you say Black Forest, or uh, uh, I'm sure it was. And uh, if I were you moved to a hospital in a particular area at a particular town? Later I, on, yeah. Well, I was moved back to Dijon, Dijon France, okay. yeah. uh, which was uh, quite a bit further back from the front lines. I don't know a particular town that we were near uh, or an area we were fighting to get into at the time I was wounded. 
they told me it was the Black Forest, and uh, I just accepted that. And, uh, I really didn't care. You really had a lot of uh, a lot to try and understand, or uh, yeah, I, make I, sense of. Yes, and you're worried about your parents, and then they, and then you learn that your two your two buddies are right. Yeah, my right. goodness. Right, I was a bit traumatized, and uh, uh, there were. Uh, I think we have to understand, as I think about it now, that uh, I was 19 years old, and uh, as I look at my uh, uh, grandson, who's <laughs> just about that age, I think, how do they send these babies to war? So. Uh, uh, that uh, was true of most of us that were there. We were all from in that age group, 18 to 20, as are the soldiers today. So it's uh, very discouraging that this should happen to our youth. Uh, I think an interesting, uh, I mentioned the letter that the nurse wrote. I think it was interesting to note that my parents did receive that uh, some days later after the telegram. and. Uh, while the note, uh, the letter I dictated said, uh, uh, don't worry, I was just scratched and uh, fortunately I'm going back to a rest area and I won't have to face any more action uh, trying to uh, uh, ease the burden of the telegram. But when they saw that, they knew it was not my handwriting and they could not imagine why somebody else would be writing this. Uh, did my hands get blown off? Was I blind? Was I... Uh, <laughs> And uh, I didn't realize that till much later, and they t they told me about it. But uh, that wasn't as smart a act as I thought it might be. They thought I was far worse off than I was. Not that I wasn't seriously that, that I wasn't seriously wounded, but I certainly didn't lose any uh, uh, arms or legs, or was blinded. Um, was it sometime during this period that you? experienced your 15 minutes of fame? Or? No, no, that no. was quite a bit later. Uh, from the MASH hospital where they uh, did uh, uh, life-saving uh, work and uh, uh, the, the, the doctors and nurses that were there were doing miraculous work uh, with uh, uh, less than uh, what they, the equipment they might have had in a hospital atmosphere. Uh, they, they used paper clips, staples, tape, anything to put the soldiers back together again. From there, once I was stabilized, <clears throat> I was sent back to a general hospital in Dijon, France. Uh, in Dijon, France, I went through four sur major surgeries where they corrected all of the things that uh, uh, were wrong with me at that moment. Uh, my leg was cast, reset and casted, and my chest was sewn up. and uh, for the most part, it was just a matter of healing after that period. Uh, I was there for, I'd say, probably a month or so, uh, possibly a little longer. From there, uh, once I had, I was well on the road to healing up, they sent me back to a hospital, again in Marseille, France. Uh, this was a hospital known as a rest, an R&R &R place, which was rest and relaxation. And uh, it was a, uh, a hospital that was set in a beautiful area. And uh, I recall uh, uh, finding great peace and uh, uh, rest uh, once I arrived there. Uh, I was there for several weeks enjoying that uh, rest and relaxation when uh, I was told I would be uh, going home again. And uh, uh, the uh, process of sending soldiers home uh, from that point was to uh, uh, cart them back to Paris, France via uh, trains and uh, in Paris fly them back to the United States. And uh, that's when uh, uh, I say I had my experience of uh, that I call 15 minutes of uh, fame. Uh, uh, and this is sort of the way it went. I was 17 years old when I enlisted in the United States Army in October of 1943. I was 18 years old in December 1944 when I was seriously wounded during a German artillery attack in the infamous World War II Battle of the Bulge. I turned 19 while in the Army Hospital in France 
recovering from those wounds, and that's really where my story starts. In February of 1945, after being treated in uh, three different medical facilities in France, I was sent to a convalescent hospital in Marseille for R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Not only was my recovery incomplete, but my body was encased in a cast that went from my left foot with just my toes showing up to my belly button. It was not a pretty sight. About noon on a beautiful, bright February 2nd day, I was given the news that every soldier prayed to hear, soldier, you're going home. It wasn't more than a few hours later that I was loaded on a stretcher and taken by ambulance to the local train depot. It was only then that I became aware that I was one of about 40 or 50 other recovering wounded uh, GIs that were about to be loaded on a hospital train and uh, begin the trip home. Our train's destination was Paris, France, where we would all be transferred to an airplane for the trip back to the United States. The railroad cars were former passenger cars that had been especially converted and outfitted to carry patients on stretchers. The cars were gutted of seats and rigged with long horizontal brackets mounted to the side wall of the cars to which the stretchers could be fastened. They were mounted three high with about 36 inches between them. I wound up in the middle position with a stretcher above me and one below. It was the furthest thing from deluxe travel as you could possibly get. However, none of us there had a complaint. We were going home and it didn't matter how. The trip to Paris was an overnight journey. The train started rolling at about dusk. I can still hear the exceptionally loud clickety-clack of the wheels. I guessed that the exaggerated sound was because of the extreme bareness of the reconverted railway cars. I had drifted off to sleep but was awakened about 10 p.m. by severe pain in my casted foot. The pain was so intense that I called for a medic, a first aid man, who was on duty in our car. When he checked my foot, he explained with concern that it had swollen up badly and the pain was probably caused by the cast cutting into it. He told me he was going to get a tool to cut the cast and relieve the pressure, but first he called to an assistant to stay with me until he returned. The assistant was a pleasant, smiling lady dressed in olive drab army fatigues. When I, what I remember most was her sincere concern, sympathy, and kindness. Her voice was calming and comforting and took the edge off the pain. The first aid man returned shortly and proceeded to cut away the cast, and my discomfort was soon relieved. During the entire process, the lady angel held my hand and spoke soothingly about our return home. The medic asked me if I was okay. I assured him and I uh, thanked him very much. Uh, he said he would return later to check on me. Then this lady angel asked me to reassure her that I was okay and when I did, she leaned over and kissed me. Holy smokes, she kissed me. In, the, in that instant it took for the shock to wear off, she was gone. I was devastated. I never got a chance to thank her. About a half hour later, the medic returned to check on me, and he said, as he said he would. Once I assured him I was okay, he asked me, do you know who that lady was that held your hand? I said I didn't and was disappointed that I didn't get a chance to thank her. Soldier, he said, that was Marlena Dietrich. She rides these trains regularly as a volunteer maiden of mercy. She prefers being anonymous and doesn't look for any thanks. Well, we arrived in Paris the next morning. Later that day, we were loaded on an airplane and flew back to the U.S. I never saw Miss Dietrich after that one special night. I can tell you that my experience during World War II could fill a small book, but one of the most outstanding and memorable was my 15 minutes of fame when Marlena Dietrich kissed me. Thank you. Thank you.
so you're um, you basically you basically were a very healthy young man. I mean, you uh, to to be to, to, yes, to, to recovered so. from from that degree of uh, harm suffered by your body, and then the but the army decided you were not going to go back to the front. You were going to go back. You're going to go oh, back yeah. home. Yeah, I was too seriously injured. I couldn't uh, walk or uh, do anything at that point. So my days in battle were over. They were definitely over right. because of the injuries. Right. So you land back from Paris. You're flying back to the United States. Right. We landed in New York, and uh, they loaded us into a, uh, a waiting area. And uh, a while in that waiting area, they interviewed us as to where our homes were and uh, with uh, the prospect of uh, uh, bringing us back to a hospital near our homes where we would continue our recovery and where uh, it would be easier for families to uh, visit us. Uh, I, of course, told them that I was from Chicago and uh, I knew there were several hospitals in and around Chicago and uh, they said, sure, we'll be happy to see what we can do. Uh, uh, the, uh, later that day, things moved very fast. I was really quite surprised. Later that day, I was loaded onto a train for a trip back to where I thought I was going, but uh, I didn't ask any questions. And the next day, when the train arrived at its destination, I found that I was in Topeka, Kansas. Oh, <laughs> so they, whoever I spoke yeah. to who interviewed me, uh, either didn't uh, didn't hear well or didn't know his geography very well. So uh, I was quite disappointed. But uh, when you're in the army, it doesn't pay to complain. So uh, that was another train trip back then, was it? No, no, that's where it was. I, uh, I was uh, brought into uh, the Winter General Hospital in Topeka, Kansas, uh, which happened to be uh, on the same location with the Manager Clinic. The Manager Clinic was a, uh, a psychological uh, hospital, and uh, when I heard that, I thought to myself, oh my god, am I nuts? <laughs> <laughs> is, that where, is that why I wound up here? But uh, it turned out that uh, Dr. Menninger had donated half of his facility to the Army for uh, recovering GIs uh, and uh, had nothing to do with psychological problems. But that's where I spent the balance of my recovery. And uh, the staff there was good, the doctors were good, and I had no real complaint other than it was uh, practically impossible for my uh, family to visit, except for uh, one member of the family, an uncle, who represented the family and came out to see me. Uh, when, you, other, when you, excuse me, when you landed in, in in New York, were you able to make a telephone call yes, to yes. the family and yes, say, "Yes, I did indeed." Yes, I. Boy, that must have been a great news for your mother. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The family cried pretty good at that point, but um, <laughs> all of the soldiers as well. We were in a big uh, room, uh, size of a gymnasium, and uh, it was almost comical or pitiful to see all the soldiers crying at uh, having come home. Um, so you're, um, you're down there in Topeka, Kansas. Is, is that you're there until, um, until October of 1945 then? Or? That is correct. I, uh, I uh, arrived there in uh, the middle of March and uh, spent uh, the balance of the year until uh, October at um, Winter General in Topeka. And uh, they had to do some minor uh, repairs uh, as I during the healing process. And uh, but I spent my uh, the last days in the Army recovering there and uh, got my uh, honorable medical discharge from there. You also received um, um, Purple Heart and Bronze Stars. Yes. Yes, I did that, and that was awarded back in, uh, actually, in the Jeanne, France. Uh, during my stay there, uh, it was uh, not unusual for uh, officers to come through the wards and speak to all of the men, and occasionally there was a, uh, a ceremony where uh, uh, soldiers were awarded uh, medals, and at one point, uh, during one of the ceremonies, I uh, was awarded uh, 
the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. So you were down in uh, in in Topeka uh, when Germany surrenders, right? And you're also there when uh, Japan surrenders, I think. Yes, I I can't recall. Were there were there any celebrations? Oh yeah, there? yeah. I suppose yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there was always something going on, partying, and uh, uh, we were all happy to be. Uh, uh, alive and in one piece, and uh, uh, it was it was better days. Were there would people, entertainers or dignitaries visit the hospital? And very very often, very often. Uh, I don't recall uh, having been party to uh, any of the uh, the entertainment uh, like the Bob Hope uh, visits mm -hmm. uh, while I was in Europe. But once back uh, in the United States in the hospital. Uh, we had a number of uh, people come by. I particularly remember Catherine Grayson. Of course, when I mention all these names now, nobody knows who they are, but uh, uh, Catherine Grayson was a uh, quite popular actress and singer. And there was a number of uh, people. Uh, Barney Ross, the boxer, uh, he came by. So we, we saw a number of uh, dignitaries and and stars that came to visit the hospitals. The um, so then you're you're discharged, and then is it a train ride at that point back to back to Chicago? Yes. Uh, uh, during the period that I was in Topeka, uh, at one uh, I was I graduated to uh, crutches. Uh, my leg was still in a cast, and uh, during the period I received. Uh, a pass to visit home and went home on crutches and that uh, trip was made on a train and uh, back again to the hospital of course and uh, once uh, discharged uh, we also received uh, uh, tickets uh, to return to our home and uh, that was done on a train so you're back in uh, you're back in Chicago then right um, back home in Chicago so is there still a uh, does your rehabilitation kind of have to continue for a while after that, or did you, were you pretty much able to move I, around uh, the city on your own? Or No, I was uh, pretty well healed up by that time. I must say that uh, uh, the, the work done by the uh, Army hospitals and Army nurses and physicians uh, were uh, more than adequate, and I have uh, no complaint. Uh, like I've heard in recent days about uh, uh, wounded uh, soldier care. We were taken care of very well. And um, I, uh, I bless the doctors and nurses who put me together and uh, who were responsible for my recovery. They were very, uh, very excellent, and uh, my recovery was quite complete by the time that uh, I was uh, discharged. It was a matter of uh, maybe... Uh, uh, learning to walk without a limp or something to that effect, but I was totally healed up. Uh, to, a, to a complete layperson sitting here, in the most ignorant sense of that word, I mean, it's amazing. That's that's within the year. Right. From December, you you suffer all those horrendous injuries, and then um, less than a year later, you're you're able to you've recovered right. to to, a, to some degree. Um, Amazing, I, amazing. I, uh, I guess I, uh, I was pretty well healed up. The uh, funny part about that particular subject is um, they could uh, not remove all of the tiny shell fragments that uh, had entered my body. And uh, particularly in my leg, I had uh, some shell fragments that were lying against uh, uh, muscle and ligaments and... Uh, they were afraid if they went to remove them, uh, they might uh, injure uh, more than uh, they could repair. So uh, those uh, shrapnel pieces were not really causing me any difficulty at the time I was discharged. Uh, but later on, within, I think, a year, uh, the, uh, the fragments began to move and uh, I, uh, one of them, actually, my skin opened up and popped out, and uh, after that I had some pain, and uh, 
uh, I had a very good private doctor at home, and I went to him. They x-rayed my leg. They said that, uh, yes, you still have a, a shell fragment in there, and uh, why don't you go back to the VA and have them remove it? And I said, you know, I'm here. Why don't you do it? And uh, uh, I was operated uh, here at uh, the... Uh, I'm trying to remember, I believe it was the Weiss Hospital on uh, the Outer Drive and at Wilson, and uh, they removed uh, more shrapnel from my leg at that time, and uh, I was okay. I, I still, I didn't totally uh, eliminate a limp, and uh, uh, I also, uh, my breathing is affected. I don't have full lung power uh, that I once had. So I was left with some uh, scars and uh, uh, not only psychological but physical and uh, things that uh, affected my later life, but not that it uh, stopped me from getting a job, getting married, and uh, going on with life from there. So that was um, that... Um you're improving your improving physical condition, and then um, um, this worry or this sensation of these alien fragments in the body. I mean, that's a mighty psychological factor when you come when you come back into civilian life. Um, it is, except for one thing: when you're young, you're invincible. Other vets have <laughs> said, that. "Yeah." So, so, did you did you were you able to resume school? Or yes, uh, at that time. Uh, the uh, Army had a uh, uh, program uh, called the GI Bill, and uh, that uh, bill uh, entitled uh, returning uh, veterans to go back to school at the government expense. And I took advantage of that and returned to college and uh, did uh, attend uh, uh, college, uh, a couple of different colleges because I changed my major. You didn't go back to to IIT or no 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 I had uh, decided that uh, I don't know why there was a number of reasons I think I had a bad taste in my mouth uh, because of the engineering uh, experience and I had a, um, a cousin of mine who was a very successful dentist and uh, I decided I saw him making a lot of money and I decided that was the way to go so I enrolled at uh, the Loyola Dental College the north campus of Loyola, and uh, started uh, my training as a pre-dent. But um, in my second term, they asked me to dissect a frog, and when they handed me the, the poor dead frog to dissect, I said, I cannot do this. And uh, I decided that the medical world was not my place. So I switched to uh, a course uh, major in business and transferred to Loyola campus downtown and uh, attended Loyola uh, for a while. I attended the Loyola downtown campus as a business major for a while, and uh, friends of mine had uh, uh, enrolled in uh, Roosevelt College, which just uh, received their charter uh, in downtown Chicago, and uh, they uh, uh, asked me to join them at Roosevelt, and I transferred and uh, went to uh, Roosevelt College for a while, still with my business major. During that period, I met my the young lady who became eventually became my wife, and once married, I had lost my. Uh, a taste for education, wanted to get back into the work world and earn some money and start my life as a married and family man. So uh, my children to this day kid me about having attended five different <laughs> colleges and never getting a degree. They probably made up for it though, I have a feeling. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Did, um, did you stay in contact with anybody, any of your wartime buddies after the after uh, service or...? There was uh, a couple that I kept in touch with for a while. Uh, uh, one of the uh, gentlemen that uh, was a soldier, I, I didn't have any contact with any of the 
uh, people that I fought in Europe with. Uh, as I say, 90% uh, uh, of uh, the outfit I was with were wiped out, and uh, I never, I lost complete touch with anybody in that uh, 100th Century Division. Was that all in that, during the, the period when you were injured? Right. They suffered so many casualties? Right. Yeah. Uh, when I got back to uh, Topeka and uh, I was in the hospital there, I made some friends. Uh, uh, one of them was uh, uh, a uh, gentleman by the name of Foreman, who was one of the uh, sons of uh, a uh, big dealership, car dealership in Chicago, Foreman Motors, who uh, later made news by being shot by a robber uh, at the place of business, but he and I were buddies, and uh, I recall at the hospital, he, uh, when we be, he befriended me, he said, when I got out of service, you come and see us, I've, I've got a job for you at our dealership. Uh, that never happened, of course, but uh, we, uh, we, did, uh, we were close friends uh, at that time. I did have contact with him after uh, I was uh, discharged and uh, we had lunch a number of times. I had other things that I wanted to do, uh, so I didn't, uh, I didn't take up his offer for a job. But other than that, I have not had any contact with military personnel that I had come in contact with ever. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations? I belong or? to uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars for a short time. I do not at this time belong to any, but uh, I did at that uh, a short time after I got out of service. Uh, I was preoccupied with uh, work and family and uh, other things, and uh, I didn't really have time for yeah. organization. The young lady that you that you married, um, had she ever seen you in uniform? Never. She met I, you after the, She met me afterward, after and after. except for pictures. Uh, she never saw me in uniform, no. Um, as we enter the approach, the last part of the interview, um, one of the questions that we always ask of our veterans is um, uh, to reflect, um, how do you think your service and um, experiences affected your life? Uh, to the extent that uh, I hate war and uh, hate the reports of young men being killed uh, and uh, find that it is a terrible uh, disease of the human beings that they fight one another. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, I can't say that there was much other effect. Yeah, I think that's um, that leads right into the second uh, question which you may have answered, uh, has your did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I, uh, I of course, am proud of all of the young men that go to fight, but uh, I, I am very sorry for them and sorry for their parents and families. Uh, I guess there's no way out of having armies and uh, uh, protecting uh, one's country, but uh, the idea that uh, uh, young men have to go to war and be killed, uh, it, uh, it really destroys me. Is there anything, uh, as we reach the end of the interview, is there anything that you would like to add that we may not have covered in regard no, to No, I think that uh, this has been a, uh, an excellent uh, interview, and I really appreciate the time and effort that uh, you do, Mr. O'Neill, and uh, those of you, those that work with you, and uh, I think it was, uh, I feel honored that I was interviewed. You're very kind. Thank you. It's a beautiful uh, interview, and um, um, there's a lot to be learned from listening to this interview, I'm sure. Thank you. I mean, I know. Um, and then you're also very generous with some of these um, note, uh documents and, um, and letters and pictures that relate to your uh, to the interview today and we'll add this to the uh, to the transcript and sort of uh, illustrate it in a way.
Great. Okay. And uh, I think we've reached the end of the interview. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank nice you. meeting you. you too, sir.